Well, hello there. I'm Dave, and welcome to the Interaction Field series of live streams that we have. Um, these live streams, we have the author of this wonderful book here, uh, Eric Jochenstaller, who um, he's, uh, he brought out this book a few weeks ago, The Interaction Field. And in these series, we talk about some things that are relevant and, and uh, adjacent to what is covered in the book. And we'll talk to Eric in just a second. But first of all, I want to say to you, wonderful viewer, that we want you to get involved. We want you to be giving us uh, your questions, giving us feedback, giving us your comments as you go. So this is about you getting involved as well. Um, I will then come in with your questions as, because I'm on your side. Um, I, I will come in and I will pose the questions on your behalf. But first of all, I think it's time to immediately get into it and say hello to the author of this book, Eric Jochenstaller. Hello, Eric. Hello, I am oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> I, just uh, were... I just finished reading it. <laughs> <laughs> now, a couple Good of days time. ago, our, our guest today, um, David Kamlos, uh, you went into a bookshop a couple of days ago and picked up his book. In now, the science also, section, in the science section of Barnes & Noble. science Nine. section, wow. Yes. That's, uh, that, that, that took quite a bit of hunting to it. That's not where I'd expect it to be. Yeah, exactly. um, did, you, did you also go and have a, a little look for, for your own book to see if it was on the shelf? I couldn't find it. It was sold out. They say they have, they have a waiting line downstairs where people are waiting, like in... <laughs> I was. I think I was dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's introduce our wonderful guest for today. So we've got um, David Comlos, who is the CEO of Syntegrity. Now, what he does is he advises people and businesses on how to solve problems and execute them dramatically faster. And he's the co-author of the book Cracking Complexity: The Breakthrough Formula for Solving Just About Anything Fast. And Eric, you and I have both been reading this book. It's, it's a wonderful book. It's really nicely written. Um, great, uh, great stuff in there from the very beginning. Um, and we're going to be discussing some of that uh, thinking that's in the book today. So I guess from London and from New York, let's say hello to Toronto and say, hey, David, hello. How are you doing today? Great. And it's great to be here. Fantastic. Now, now, there's one thing that I um, I absolutely love from your thinking. You split it up into problems, into simple problems, complicated problems, and complex problems. It's probably a good place, I guess, for us to start with the conversation before Eric um, sort of starts quizzing you and grilling you. Is could, could you describe um, what you mean by these three different buckets of problems? 
Absolutely. This is inspired by Dave Snowden and his Kinevin framework. There are different kinds of problems. And it's really important to know the type of challenge you're dealing with because just like form follows function, the type of approach you take to solving a problem needs to follow the type of problem you're dealing with. So there are simple challenges that people solve every day. There's no need to really go into that. They basically just observe the facts and they, they render a decision, a solution. Complicated challenges are much trickier. Um, the complicated challenges, that category of challenge uh, are considered to be solved challenges, challenges that have been solved many times before. If your car breaks down, that's a complicated challenge. If you are implementing a new accounting system, that's a complicated challenge. Difficult for the novice, um, but there are many, many experts available to you who have solved the problem before and are willing to do it for you. Complex challenges are much more difficult. Um, they're typically the defining challenges we face in society, in our organizations, in our lives. How do we grow faster? How do we merge better? How do we transform? How do we digitize? How do we deal with the opioid epidemic? These kinds of multidimensional, multifaceted challenges that need to be solved fresh. And where it's not just enough to solve them, you also need critical mass buy-in from key stakeholders if you're going to see behavior change, if you're going to see the solutions implemented and executed. That's where I have specialized over the last uh, 20 years. It's what the book Cracking Complexity is about. How do you go about cracking the complex multidimensional challenges faster? Yeah. Great. So, so you didn't Eric. make it exactly, David, you didn't make it exactly easy on you because if I look at other firms like yours, um, they would say complicated problems, you know, um, helping in a digital transformation, installing an IT system, uh, a new accounting system. That's good enough for us and we can become a sales force, SAP. We can become really big companies. Why would you, I'm very curious, why, why, why complex problem? What got you there? Why, why, why not taking your life easy and, and become a billionaire like Mark Benioff, let's say? <laughs> Well, I'm just drawn to, you know, more of the complex side of things. It, uh, it's what stoked my passions. Um, I've always believed that it's the, it's the complex challenges that are def the defining challenges where you can really, if you can find a way to address them in a more systematic, more reliable way, you can really put a dent in the universe. That's not to take away from, you know, uh, customer relationship management and the importance of good ERP and and you know just good accounting and good process, um, but no one is ever you know stuck for very 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 long in an intractable way in implementing a new ERP system. But they are stuck in transforming their organization or delivering on their mandate for citizens um, on the tough challenges, and that's what uh, what got me excited when I when I encountered this, this novel way of thinking, this novel approach mm -hmm. to systematically addressing the kinds of big challenges we really want to address. Now, now uh, you must, you've done this for many years. I looked on your, on your CV. So mm -hmm. how is it that it seems like we are today in the pandemic in a world, you know, it's called stakeholder capitalism, where mm -hmm. you're not just selling, you're not just optimizing around shareholders anymore. You're optimizing around a much larger stakeholder set, if you will, um, uh, solving bigger problems. And we are just now through this pandemic or in the middle of it or in the beginning, I, I'm not sure exactly. Mm -hmm. So how is it that that you start so many years ago solving that, and then you then you write a book last year just in time, so we know how to solve some of these complex things. I mean, your timing couldn't be better, it seems. Ah, well, thank you. When we started our company uh, 20 years ago, I remember discussing with some of the founders, uh, we're probably, you know, between five and 15 years uh, off in terms of timing, but let's let's make a go of it. Um, in the early days, people used to look at us when we said the word complexity and not really appreciate what we were talking about. Um, today, nobody's wondering about what we mean when we say, you know, the world is increasingly complex. You have to learn how to be um, matching that complexity. 
uh, how to be exponential, at least temporarily, mm -hmm. to match exponential challenges. No one's looking at you with, uh, you know, uh, confusion. And so we felt after 20 years with such a track record, uh, working with Fortune 50 CEOs, large governments, private equity firms, global associations, that uh, we really wanted to capture this in a book and make it available to people so that they could begin to implement pieces of it or all of it uh, if they're inspired. And yes, like you say, Eric, the timing was good. And, um, you know, we've, we, I will say, Eric, that much of what's in Cracking Complexity is how do you orchestrate large groups to solve big challenges? We've always done that face to face in the same room, in the same place, whether it's in Shanghai or Austin or New York or Zurich. Um, over the you know last year, even leading up to the pandemic, luckily, but certainly over the first few months of the pandemic, we've been able to transition the formula to um, virtual gatherings uh, like we're in right now with the same kinds of outcomes, surprisingly, but, uh, but fortunately. Very cool, very cool. Mm -hmm. So the, the method is called the complexity formula. It has 10 steps yeah. and I'm I'm, I wonder whether, and I got intrigued by that because I wrote the brand, the in the action field book, and and I identified problems like in agriculture. How do you increase the productivity uh, of the land? Which isn't not anyone can really solve that. It really requires large groups in your way. Mm -hmm. I looked at healthcare, I looked at automotive, I looked at consumer goods, I looked at luxury, all these areas. And I and it felt to me that every time all the, the solutions, the, all the problems that are being solved right now in these industries are really sol only piecemeal solved you know like uh, like uh, uber would uber as an example you know would solve for a more convenient way of um, of getting cars you know getting from point a to point b in new york city and uh, maybe uh, uh, by by ordering through mobile phone but other than that it didn't really solve much it it also causes a lot of problems what i really would like to know is is maybe on the high level first sort of what is that your approach, you said like large groups, what is that methodology, that, that, that complexity formula versus what is the typical way of solving maybe even complicated problems? What's, what's sort, of, sort of the big difference? Yeah, so um, when you think about the, the way in which you've experienced solving problems, the way in which most people approach problems, the way we've been brought up is very much to do a combination of interviews, and analysis and some synthesis and really the prevailing paradigm if you will for solving big challenges is to either strike a task force small group of people smart people well-intentioned people ambitious people who really want to solve the challenge or call in very high-powered consultants, also very smart, very driven, very desirous of solving the challenge. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and what they will typically do is set up a what we call a hub and spoke model. If you think of a bicycle wheel, the consulting team or the task force or the hybrid consulting team task force will be the, the hub of the bicycle wheel. And the spokes themselves are the people they feel they need to interview in order to understand the lay of the land. And so much of our problem solving efforts, whether it's through sprints, whether it's through just long engagements, is by interviewing individuals. And the problem with that is that um, if you have a lot of time, it can go very well, but it really places the onus of the solving on a small group of people. And what we find and what, what organizations find these days is that that takes quite a lot of time and doesn't necessarily move the needle on the buy-in and the alignment you need from a multi-stakeholder group to actually buy into whatever the solution is and start to execute. That's the traditional approach mm -hmm. uh, by and large, and it can work in many situations, especially complicated situations like implementing an ERP or a new CRM or a new accounting system where you've created the solution, it's solved. Now you have to understand the lay of the land through interviews and traditional workshops 
Um, and once you understand the lay of the land, you can render your solution like you've done elsewhere. Well, there is a problem with this. You know, it, it assumes that it assumes that the, 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 the leadership team has the talent to solve that, you know. Correct, correct. That is the paradigm that we've been brought up on. We differ from that um, depending on the situation, but for complex challenges like how do I grow faster? How do I realize the full benefits of my merger? How do I raise my net promoter scores? How do I become number one in delivering oncology services to patients and so on? Um, those are complex multidimensional challenges. And like you said, Eric, you can't rely on just the leadership team to be able to match all the facets of the challenge. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible. There's a law in system science called the law of requisite variety, mm -hmm. which really says only variety can destroy variety. Only variety can master variety. When you're dealing with a high variety challenge, a complex challenge, you have to match the, the variety with an equal amount of variety. The way you do that is by tapping into a broader and deeper diversity of talent from inside your organization, but also outside your organization. So if you're looking to grow faster, for example, you would bring together people from various levels of your organization. You may bring together people from Vivaldi as well as advisors. You may bring together someone from McKinsey, a supply chain partner, someone from Accenture, if there's gonna be technology implementation uh, implications, you might bring together someone from the regulator, two customers. It really depends on the situation, but you want to match the variety of the challenge as best you can with the right diversity of talent. And then the next step in, or the next essential, if you will, in matching the complexity is not just to bring together the right variety, you have to collide that variety of people together. You have to literally network their brains together deliberately and precisely so that all that variety is able to connect together. Every individual that you, de that you determine is imperative to have in your solving process and your aligning process well, they have to be connected to one another. You yes. can't just bring 30, 40 people together and have five or six of them connect with each other because they are keenly interested in the outcomes while the rest of the people check out for all the reasons that large groups are dysfunctional. You have to actually um, deal with those dysfunctions by connecting everyone together and then orchestrating many, many back and forth conversations in an iterative way. And when you do that, yeah you can actually solve the challenges very, very quickly. When you don't do that, you only really get a partial solution. I love this because, you know, I, I'm thinking just now an automotive company decides on uh, selling electric cars and mm. then they realize that uh, uh, they realize dealers don't want to sell electric cars because they are less moving parts in electric cars. They break down less. So a dealer makes his money on service revenues, uh, the service during the lease per period, let's say. Yeah. So, so when you solve the problem at the high level, what you typically do is you solve a problem, a, co a complex problem at the CEO and the leadership team level. And you say, oh, guys, after a workshop and working with the consultants and experts, you say, like, we gotta, we got to solve the problem. We are going to go electric, guys. And then what happens is once you have made the decision, we're going to go electric, then uh, just as an example, then you push down, you sort of, we always, we used to call, you know, like push it down to the frontline employees and the frontline out there, the ones who manage the dealer network, they say, wait a moment, you guys are crazy. Well, I can't get dealers. We have a massive dealer network. That's our massive competitive advantage. And now I can't get them to sell electric cars. They hate them. They hide them behind their, their parking lot. They want to sell combustion engine where they make their money. So what happens is the, you're never really solving the problem because, because you're, you're solving the problem sequentially most of the time. And by yeah. doing sequential, you're, you're actually causing yourself a, a huge implementation problem. And that's maybe why all of these things fail. I agree completely. When you, when you leave out the requisite variety of players. Yeah, that's right. 
you come up with a partial solution that doesn't bridge the gap between strategy and yep. operationalization. It leaves out a lot of the finer details, the realities, the tangibility yep. that you're looking for. We've actually worked with automotive companies. And in fact, Eric, um, just like you put your finger on, have involved not just the leadership, but also the suppliers, the dealers themselves, yep. um, external advisory firms like JD Power and other experts. And when you bring that whole ecosystem together on uh, a challenge, in this case, you know, how do we deliver a differentiated consumer experience inside and outside of the dealership, you can actually get to outcomes that are going to be relevant to all the constituent parties and have a big impact on that consumer experience because all those players were involved in co-creating the solution and in, in battle testing it along the way. When you don't battle test these things and it's pushed down, which is the old way, um, you're, you're pushing down solutions that aren't really necessarily solutions, as you say. So, so it sounds like that formula, complexity formula, it's almost like a secret, a secret formula that, that like Coca-Cola has a secret formula about producing Coke, but, but it isn't really a secret because when I read in the book, there is actually 10 steps, right? Mm -hmm. It's ACT, LEAP, ACT are the acronyms, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. to actually make that work. So can you sort of give us an example or maybe illustrate how this, how those 10 things come together and, and, and maybe, maybe we'll go through a few examples and, and make it sort of tangible. Sure. Uh, we worked with a large financial services firm recently that um, was a leader in its business and they uh, experienced a big decline in their net promoter scores. Their customers were vocally dissatisfied. They had lost um, their consumer-oriented focus, and the CEO wanted to um, really move the needle on raising customer satisfaction in a very tangible way and reinventing their service model. And so the first step was to articulate that to frame that set of outcomes and the challenge in the form of a really good question. That's, that's one of the first steps in the complexity formula. Articulate your challenge in the form of a good question. A good question is uh, specific about types of outcomes you're looking for, mm -hmm. time bound, and it calls for action and has a sense of urgency. For example, what must we do now and over the next two years to grow our net promoter scores by, you know, 50 points and, uh, you know, regain our standing as the number one service provider in our industry. That's one way of framing a question. There's many different ways of framing questions, um, but it's very important to take your challenge, your goals, your timelines, and embed that in a really good question. Then once you know what the question is and what your desired outcomes are, you then look for who, do I need to include? That's where you look through the lens of requisite variety and you um, take a very aggressive approach to being very broad and deep on the diversity of talent you want to identify. Mm -hmm. All the people who have the knowledge, the experience, the uh, expertise, the influence yeah. when you combined that they could connect the dots themselves and actually have the um, influence to get execution going right and so you're, you're thinking not five or six key influencers not just within the four walls of your organization or you know the country that it's located in you're looking globally you're looking at customers you're looking at supply chain partners you're looking at advisors you're looking at various different levels inside your organization you're looking at the usual suspects and you're looking at non-usual suspects and when you have that list you have to view that list as your special purpose group that's going to answer this question, but also whose buy-in is going to be essential to actually move the solution forward. So now, that's, those are the ACT, the first three steps, you know, acknowledge yeah. the complexity. Yeah. Um, then the second one is, is uh, construct the, the right question, you know, formulate mm -hmm. it, and then it comes locate, uh, I'm sorry, T, target the, the, the variety. So that's, yeah. that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. And that's then you go, yeah. That's really cool. You know what I really like about the book? 
is that it is not just, okay, how do you do that? It's actually, you have in your book, by each of these chapters, you mm -hmm. describe what are the questions you need to ask? Mm -hmm. What is the yes question and the no question? And, and what do you do about it? So I think it's a, it's a really nice blueprint of, of how to actually go through those steps. Yes, it's intended to be a handbook that can be uh, translated into action pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, Eric, like I said, once you have the right variety of people um, brought together, whether face to face or over Zoom, Teams, WebEx, Meet, um, it's really, really critical to connect them in a network very deliberately. Um, mathematically, you're solving for n times n minus one connection points where n is the number of people participating. And this is important for your listeners and viewers to wrap their heads around. If you're calling a meeting with 12 people, there's 12 times 11 connection points to account for. If you're calling a meeting with 40 people because you have decided that it's these 40 people who together have the diversity of talent and influence to move the needle on this big challenge. You can't just identify those people and bring them together. You have to network them in a way that accounts for the 40 times 39 connection points. And we use software to do that. You can use Excel to use that, other types of spreadsheets to do that. But it's really important that you don't just throw these people in a room and say, let's have at it. You have to connect them in a way that's deliberate. And then in the formula, once they're in conversation with each other, dialoguing over um, you know, how to answer the question, what are the answers to the question, it's important to iterate. We find three rounds of iteration on a specific set of topics is really the right number of iterations, meaning if you can start your conversations around what is the state of affairs regarding this challenge, and then once you've discussed it fully, go to what could we do about addressing the challenge until, and then finally get to what will we do to address the challenge. When you've connected people directly to one another and you have multiple collisions back and forth, back and forth, that's the trick to getting to the final, what will we do about this challenge? What are the answers to the big question? And it only really takes a few days, sometimes only a few hours if you've oh. brought the right people together and collided them in a very deliberate way. I love that that uh, iterative approach, what you call the mm -hmm. condition, and then and it comes out. So um, I, I love that methodology. You know, you describe it so well, and and uh, uh, it gives you it gives sort of like a nice blueprint. There's a very beautiful sort of like illustration of of how this mm -hmm. works. Um, Tell me how I, maybe we, with a few minutes we have. I what I really like about this is is that that you know we all have organized workshops. We all have organized a leadership team, uh, 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 an offsite meeting, and we 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 do that pretty much almost on a. Um, haphazard way, sort of like, oh, how are we gonna do that? Who should be there? And we are not, there is not a system to that. And what, what you, your 20 years of experience almost combines the scientific approach, like from systems thinking, let's say, uh, you mentioned David Snowden, for example, and then you you apply it in a practical way and and, uh, in, 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 and you build sort of a systematic way of becoming successful in in, in addressing sort of the key, key questions, you know, key compl complex questions, if you will. So that that's what I like very much. Tell it, so I need to know a bit more about, and, and I need to know more about sort of the the practicalities of of you said it's two days you work in this or three days or how sort of like what is a typical sort of like problem solving uh, exercise look like? Um, when it's face to face in the same place and you're bringing together anywhere from twelve to fifty or sixty people, it's between a day and a half and three days to get through the thousands of collisions, the thousands of micro collisions that are absolutely imperative to, um, to engineer. Mm -hmm. um, when we're doing it in distributed formats over Zoom and the other platforms, um, we do it over an elapsed time frame of five to 10 days, where we are going through three rounds of multiple collisions on different topics in order to answer a big challenge that's been formed in the in the in the in the way in the 
form of a question. Is right? that accounting? Is that accounting for the, the the naps that happen between all of these participants? I go like, okay, I'm done. Yeah, with it. yeah, yeah. We have to give people time to nap and surf other sites while they're while they're online, yeah. and and yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. It's almost it's almost better to do it online because there's no travel involved, and and people can access resources online uh, when they sort of like work on something. So it can become an intensive work session, really. It's uh, that's exactly right. To our frankly, to our surprise. Yeah, we find the um, distributed version over these platforms with the complexity formula um, to be incredibly effective at tapping into the right person and the right people anywhere in the world, whenever you want, all together, all at once, um, which, you know, these days has to be the case because we're yeah. not planning in the same room. It's just not allowed, number one. And number two, going forward, this is this is the future. Being able to tap into the right people on the right challenge to answer the right question with the right variety and orchestrating them so that they take many brains and engineer them into one big brain that has access to all the talent and knowledge and experience and influence it needs to be able to tackle these challenges that normally take many months or longer and sometimes never get resolved, to be able to make leaps of major progress that's a big deal. That's a big deal on the complex challenges. And that's what this, uh, this book, this formula, and I believe the work that you do is all about as well. Yeah. So for me, the way I see it is it, it, there's, a, there's a part that is about the understanding and understanding the complexity of the challenge. And mm -hmm. then you can say, I can use traditional ways of solving that. Uh, you know, like um, I improve uh, market share is dropping, uh, revenues are coming down or I have bad NPS score. There are uh, a number of recommendations that you can mm -hmm. go with. But I think what's really the exciting part is, is that imagine you lay out through your methodology the complexity of that problem and you under fully understand all the interactions and all the, the interdependencies of mm -hmm. that system. Mm -hmm. So when you say, look, uh, like in the agricultural field, I use uh, the John Deere example. It isn't just better mowing with a better tractor that, that makes the, the farm more productive. It's better fertilizers, better crop. It is better science. It's, it's understanding what, what soil condition, how deeply you plant the plant. And all of these things hang together in order to increase the productivity of a land. So then in order to do that, for my world, and that's how we connect, I think, David, is that that that's basically you're describing an interaction field uh, that how everything connects. Your method sort of like illuminates that and gets clear. This is if we want to grow and if we want to solve world hunger, if we want to improve the productivity of the field or profitability of farms, there are 500 million farms out there. It's the biggest 40% of the earth is actually is covered with farms and or farming. So it's a big part of, the, of our planet in some ways. If you want to solve for that, then the way to do that is now is to, to, to say of that in the action field, what is the part that I can solve for with a traditional ways, a better tractor, better this? And what is the other part where you build what I call an in the action field model or a digital platform or a digital ecosystem? We talked about that before, right? So yeah. like where you say, who are, who, do I, who are those stakeholders I have to bring together? How do I connect those? Your, your method illuminates those connections. And then you can work on saying like, what kind of in the actions? What quality of interactions, what velocity do I need uh, between farmers and you know, John Deere to make actually data, for example, useful, the interactions. So we learn enough about the conditions of the field at the right time and things like that. So so it's it's almost like what what my book talks about is, is how do you write how do you write a business model um, and how do you codify on digitize what you have sort of laid out in, in, your, in, in, in solving this complex problem. And how do you digitize it so that, so that you actually can create a, a, a business out of that and, 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 and serve, serve, I call it shared value, serve society, serve, solve some major industry problems, but also you know, get a lot closer to customers and make good money on that. So, yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. It's yeah. a, it's amazing, you know how 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 beautiful the sort of the books come together. I you yeah. know I, I know I know Dave is wants to wants to uh, get into the questions, <laughs> but I can say 
I really learned a lot uh, and I didn't take much. You know, I took two days since I got the book at Barnes and Noble and, and, and I thought like I, I, I still want to rely on David if, uh, in, a, in, a, in a real application, but I think it really helped me and, and illustrated very well, you know, what is that method, that complexity formula. You know, it's a great, it's a, it's a good methodology. Thank you, Eric. Great. So I want to come in with a couple of questions from uh, the audience. You're breaking up. Maybe it's, maybe I'll ask the question. <laughs> so so there, there's a, a oh is is, is I, I hope I hope you can hear me. Um, so so we've got here um, a question which I think's already been answered here, I think, very well. So have you tried your method methodology during COVID? I think all the stuff that you're you're doing, David, with um, with remotes, uh, doing remote workshops, I'm, I'm particularly loving doing remote workshops. I think it works really well. Um, so um, also here, Catherine um, asked, how do you clearly determine the makeup of the large groups that are brought together to solve these complex problems? And um, I, I guess the bit that I would add to that is, you know, when we're talking about requisite uh, difference and, and this sort of diversity of people, does that mean just getting as many people as you can or do you refine it down and try and create a condensed diverse group? Yeah, great questions. And thank you for the question, Catherine. Um, in the book, you'll find the 12 zones of variety and the 13 characteristics uh, for those zones. And the 12 zones look at all the different types of individuals that you need to bring together from different constituencies, from outside the system, from inside the system, from leadership all the way down to the front line, um, people who've just joined the organization through to what we refer to as the historians, the people who've been there a long time and a have a lot of context of what's been tried before external advisors, external stakeholders, customers, patients, regulators, advisors, and so forth. And then it's the 13 characteristics are when you have that list of individuals that fit in to those various zones, you also want to look for some of the softer skills. Who are the naysayers? Uh, because you want to bring naysayers in. Who are the skeptics? Um, who are the, if you like Myers-Briggs, the INTJs or the ENTPs? Um, or any other type that you need specifically? Who are the critical thinkers, the analysts? Who are the big thinkers, the creative visionaries? You want to blend, depending on the challenge, you know, depending on the special purpose, you want to have the right special purpose group to address that purpose. And like I said, you can find more under the 12 zones and the 13 characteristics. It's important to be very exhaustive and deliberate and then once you have, to Dave's question, a large list, you can then look for overlap. Oh, this person is not only a historian, but also a very creative thinker um, and a former customer. And so you can blend a few people together to, to, to lower the number or to lessen the number of people, but you still are going to be dealing with a large group of people. And that's okay, as long as you're using the formula to deal with that variety. When you don't have a way when you don't have a, a way to address the different perspectives and opinions in the room, when you don't have a way to manage the variety, then it's chaos. But when you do have a way to manage the variety, then you get great outcomes. And so it seems would, like technology okay. allows you, the Zoom technology, the pandemic, uh, to one of the questions, allows mm -hmm. you actually to have even larger groups uh, than in the, in the pre pre-pandemic world, if you will, where you at least sort of like can manage sort of like other networks that sort yeah. of contribute at certain parts of your that 10-step that, that journey. Yeah. As we speak, we've got different sized groups doing this in um, healthcare. Uh, a major hospital is figuring something out with about 45 people, doctors and so forth. Um, another pharmaceutical company is doing something around um, healthcare professionals. And we have a financial services firm with about 50, 60 people um, that have been that are being collided in various ways over Zoom and Teams and so forth. So yes, it does open up big opportunity, um, which is the way people should look at this as a major so, opportunity to change the way they power up in the face of complexity. 
So on this thing on colliding, I, 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 I don't really need your book for that because all I have to do is, is bring our leadership team together. They collide immediately. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but <laughs> I'm making a fun of that because yeah. what I really like, the beauty of your colliding, that uh, sounds like a painful thing, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, you colliding. But I think that the beautiful thing is, is that, you know, when you think of the principles, you really have everyone focus through the first three steps, act on the question, yes. uh, really, are the, really acknowledge the complexity. And mm -hmm. then what you have is, is you bring in those people and, uh, and, and it is an iterative process, that collision. And, and it's the very, and, and when you think of the principle of variety, how you pick and target, then it is the very, it's, that is why the system works so well. So, so it's a really, it's a, a positive colli collision in a, in a way. So, you know, it's interesting, Eric. Yes, it is a positive collision. There's, there's further techniques that make it even more positive that your viewers may appreciate. When you bring a large group of 40, 50 people together and divide them into subgroups to have, targeted conversations on pieces of the puzzle before they weave it all together. It's important to realize that some people, you know, tend to dominate the conversation. Others tend to not really contribute very much for a variety of reasons. You want to um, make the collisions not just high volume and high speed, but you want them high quality. So you can assign people different speaking roles in those meetings. You can assign some of them as members where they own the conversation and their job is to talk with one another and advance the conversation as far as possible. You can assign other people as critics who are listening very carefully and whose job is to critique what they're listening to and help the members have an even better dialogue based on what they're hearing. You can even assign people as observers, which is a very frustrating role. They can only listen, but everyone plays those roles an equal number of times and they listen differently and they contribute differently and they critique differently. And when you do that thousands and thousands of times over these micro collisions on something important, everyone gets heard, everyone hears everyone else, and you're able to pull it all together. Yep. Too That's bad correct. that the presidential, the presidential uh, uh, debates have been already passed, but they could have benefited in part to, by your method. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's time for us to start wrapping this, uh, wrapping this up now. Um, so David, what I like to ask at the end is, is for somebody who is realizing that they're in a company, that their issues aren't simple, they're beyond complicated, they are in fact complex, um, what would be the first action after, after buying your book on Amazon? So while they're waiting for it to arrive, <laughs> what would be the first action that you think that, that they should take to go down this path of actually being able to tackle a complex problem uh, successfully. Eric referred to the um, term ACT, LEAP, ACT, that summarizes the 10 steps. The first letter A in ACT is acknowledge the complexity. When you wrap your head around the fact that there are different types of challenges and each type requires its own special approach, that's the first step. Because if you're dealing with a complicated challenge that's been solved many times before, just go hire the people who've solved it many times before and have them do for you what they've done for others. Don't try to figure it out yourself. But when you're dealing with a complex challenge, understand that the traditional ways in which to approach these kinds of multidimensional challenges are limited, especially given the pace of change these days. Um, and so you need to take a different approach that's much more relevant to the pace and scale of these challenges. When you mm. start to approach the challenge the right way, that's the first step. That's the first step that will go a long, long way. Yeah, it's the, it's the preparation that leads to the, the success that you build upon. So, mm -hmm. David, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your wisdom. Um, uh, Eric, thank you very much for, for coming along and, of course, uh, asking questions and, of course, there, there's some books that you, the viewer, thank you for watching. There's some books that you need to buy, um, of course, by, uh, by David's book, uh, by Eric's book. And, and you know, d uh, found out that, that my book's actually on the same, uh, the same imprint as, uh, as, as David's as well. So um, I want to thank all of you um, 
who've been here, David, Eric, audience, everyone who gave questions, much, much appreciated. We're going to be back next week with more. And that's everything from us for today. So you can get back on with scrolling through your LinkedIn stream or getting on with work. It's up to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Looks like he has more to...